fight or flight. God's word tells us that there's a time to fight and there's a time to flee. Well, what are we supposed to fight? What are we not, not supposed to fight? When are we supposed to fight? When are we to flee? And, you know, these are very important questions to you members of this generation of the fig tree. And I hope by the end of this message that there are questions that I've just posed that you have those answers locked in your mind because it's very important that you know these things. And we're going to hit the ground running. We're going to do a little bit of history and then we're going to get into some prophecy. But history tells us very well in God's word, when do we fight? When do we not fight? Let's begin our study this afternoon in Numbers chapter 13. And what has happened here, Israel has been in bondage to Egypt for, for years and years and years. Moses brought them out of the promised land. God told them, I'm going to give you that promised land. Yes, there are Canaanites there. There are Hittites, Jebusites. Those are, you know, part, parts of the, the Geber, giant people over there. But God promised them, he said, I, as the angel of the Lord, will go before you into the land of Canaan. It's yours. So Israel's wandering around, you know, on their way up to the promised land. And they decide, well, let's send a representative from each of the 12 tribes of Israel into the promised land to see what it is. Is it, is it a good land? You know, which way should we go up in with all these people that we have here? So the 12, selected by Moses, and the Lord did it through Moses, actually, went into the land of Canaan, and they came back to Moses and the children of Israel. We're going to pick it up with 13, verse 26. And they went and came to Moses, this being the 12 spies, as some people call them, and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And oh, that fruit was good. But you know, the Lord told them that as well. He said, that's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's recorded in verse 23 that they brought back out of the land of Canaan one cluster of grapes that was so large that two men had to carry it on a spave or a long pole between their shoulders. It was a very good land. Verse 27, And they told him, this being Moses, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Verse 28, nevertheless, or but, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. This is the second influx of the Nephilim, the descendants of those very large people, giants. 29, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, being the Mediterranean, and by the coast of Jordan. These are bad hombres over there. This would put fear in the heart of the children of Israel. And Caleb, representing Judah, stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Caleb knew that it wasn't just them that had the power to overcome that promised land. It was because that the Lord had promised them the victory. You know, he's promised you a victory as well if we do things his way. 31. But the men that went up with him said, these are the other 11 spies, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. Check that out in your strongs. That's a slanderous report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants. This means that the land is so fruitful that other nations strive over it. Therefore, thereof. 
and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Those guys are big. What would have happened if David would have taken that frame of mind with Goliath, 33? And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. I like the way Moffat Bible translates this. It says, or of the Nephilim in the Moffat Bible. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. All but one said, no, we can't go into that land. God told them to go into that land. God told them, you fight for that land. I will have my angel in front of you and I will give you the victory. And all of them but Caleb are making up lies, putting fear in the hearts of the children of Israel. What happened next? Chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? This is an eonismos. Those of you with companion Bibles, check it out. What they're saying is here, it's a sense of wishing or hoping. They actually wish that we had died in the wilderness. That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was to bring his children into the promised land. And here they are saying, we wish we had died in the, in the wilderness rather than this coming to pass. Verse 3, um, would God that we had died, we got that. Verse 3, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey or become slaves? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Four, and they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. God said, fight. They said, let's appoint a captain and flee back into Egypt Meaning what? Back into bondage, back into captivity. At Mount Horeb, they'd make a golden calf. Here, they would appoint a captain to lead them back. You know, this is out and out rebellion here against God. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And this was not to the children of Israel, but openly praying before the children of Israel to God. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Finally, at least, Caleb has a little bit of help. Joshua would join with him. You can kind of think of these two as a type for the two witnesses as well. And this in time, verse 7. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. In the Hebrew, this exceeding means it's a very, very good land. If the Lord delight in us, I haven't given him much to delight in so far, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Verse 9, only rebel not ye against the Lord. God said, fight for that land. Go into the land, the promised land, I will give it to you. Don't rebel against God. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. This defense is parted from them in the Hebrew. Is the sh they know that the shadow of God is our shade. And that bread in that verse means like, as our manna melts in the heat of the sun of the day, that's how these giants in the promised land will melt before us if we do things God's way. Would they listen? But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Would God be happy with them as he appeared before them? Absolutely not. And we're going to skip ahead a few verses here in a moment just for the sake of time. But if not for 
Moses' intercession again, he would have killed all the children of Israel with one stroke. You can read that yourself in those verses. But as usual, Moses stepping in as an intercessor between the children of Israel and God would talk logic to him and say, look, these people in Canaan heard that we came out of Egypt and you were with us. You were a, a, a fire, a tower of fire by night and a cloud by day. And they fear you because of that, because they know God is with you face to face. But if you strike down all these children of Israel with one fell swoop, then all these nations of the world are going to say, God wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. He wasn't able to bring his children into the promised land. But there was a price to pay, and, and, and Moses was successful. God said, okay, I won't strike them dead and make another nation of you even a greater and more numerous nation than what you've got now. But not one of those people that rebelled against me now these 10 times are going into the promised land. Let's pick it up in verse 25. Now the Amalekites, this is uh, Numbers 14, verse 25. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. This is God's instruction here speaking. Tomorrow turn ye and get ye into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. First God told them fight. They wanted to flee. Now God is telling them flee. That's a commandment that he just issued to them. Get you down by this way. In other words, don't go into the land of Canaan. 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. They don't trust in God. They don't believe in God. They think they should go other than the way he says. Verse 28. Say unto them, as truly as I live, that's Yahweh speaking, that's pretty truly, as truly as he lives, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. What did they say in speaking in his ears? Would God that we had died in that wilderness. You brought us out here to be killed by the sword and our sons and daughters to go into captivity, be made slaves. Jeremiah chapter 23 comes to mind there. People that say, God put this burden on me. God said, your word is your burden. You talk about cooking your own goose, they cook their own goose, 29. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you, that's 603,550 at the last numbering, that's the fighting men, according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me, doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Only Caleb and Joshua, two of the spies, did not make up an, a slanderous report. They didn't lie about the land. They said, let's go. God said, go, let's go. Verse 31. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, remember that back in verse 3 of the previous uh, chapter, or no, that's this chapter, that you brought us out here for our children to become a prey, to be made slaves. But those children that you said would become slaves, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. No promised land for you, no land that flows with milk and honey. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms, whoredoms. You know, God, you, know, you can always, when you see whoredoms, you can compare adultery and idolatry. When you fall away from God to the point that you're rebelling against his plan, that's idolatry, folks, and that's what he thinks of it here. Until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which ye search the land, and I'll point out Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22 to you there, 
the, the number of days that they sent these 12 spies into the land was 40 days. But notice here he says, the number of days you search the land. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 22, God points out, God knew what was in the promised land. He knew there were Canaanites there. He knew it was a land that flowed with milk and honey. But the people talked Moses into asking God, well, let us send these 12 spies just, you know, kind of just checking to make sure God's right. It's kind of the way I'm sure God looked at it. 35. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander or lies upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil or false report upon the land died by a plague before the Lord. That's the ten spies that came back and made up evil report, slanderous report. What can we learn from that? God has a plan. If you get in the way of God's plan being accomplished, expect to be removed. 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. This made me think, you know, when God returns is that consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. You, as a loving, serving child of God, could be standing right next to someone that is completely consumed by that fire. Like Caleb and Joshua here were standing probably in the vicinity of these ten that were killed by this plague, but it did not affect them. 39. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. That wasn't good news for them. You're going to wander around until your carcasses drop in this wilderness. What would they do? Would they accept God's judgment? Or would they rebel again? 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we be here, and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. We're right here with you now, Lord. We trust in you. We've got faith in you. We believe you. They didn't believe his judgment that they were going to die in the wilderness. He said, fight. They wanted to flee. He said, flee. What are they going to do now? 41. And Moses said, wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? It shall not prosper. What does he mean, the commandment of the Lord? Well, we picked it up in verse 25 there. He said, get ye down by the way of the wilderness, by the way of the Red Sea. That was a commandment from God. 42, go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that ye be not smitten before your enemies. It's God that gives us the strength to fight our enemies. The title of this lecture, Fight, or flight. There's a time that you can actually do both, and you had better do both. When you fight against Satan, which we'll be getting to in a little bit, you better also flee to the Lord. As David would write often in the book of Psalms, my strength is the Lord. Check out the word strength most of the time. It means fled for refuge. So when you're fighting, it's also appropriate to flee. 43, Moses continues, For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord, therefore the Lord will not be with you. 44, But they presumed to go up into the hilltop, Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Moses saying, I led you out of Egypt because God told me to lead you out of Egypt. Now you're going up to fight the Canaanites when God told you to flee, but I'm not with you this time. 
neither is the Ark of the Covenant, meaning God is not with them either. 45, then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in the hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. 24, and Micaiah said, behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. This really needs some help. What Micaiah is telling this Zedekiah is you will see that the Spirit is not with you on the day that you go into a chamber within a chamber, which is a hiding place. This would probably be at the time when he came after the battle was over and Ahab was dead. And I'm sure Jezebel and the friends of Ahab we're probably looking for these 400 prophets that said, go up and prosper, though God will give you the victory. Then the king of Israel said, take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, thus saith the king, put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction or distress and with water of affliction until I return in peace. Ahab didn't believe the prophecy until I return in peace. That would be a long wait. Verse 27, and Micaiah said, if thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, hearken all ye people. And remember, we got the king of Judah we got the king of Israel sitting in this open place with their thrones on, with their thr sitting on their thrones with their robes on. So he's calling Israel and Judah to witness that if Ahab returns in peace, I'm not a prophet of God. 28. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. I'm a little disappointed in Jehoshaphat. I mean, he really was a good king of Judah sending out the priest and, uh, to teach God's word to the people of Judah. And, and I'm really surprised that he didn't head the other direction after that last little deal of events, but let's see what happens. 29, and the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go up to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to the battle. Jehoshaphat disappointing me a little bit again there. Who was it that the prophet of the Lord said would be killed? The shepherd of the flock. So Ahab saying, man, if I, take, if I go out there to battle in my robes like this, they're going to recognize me as the shepherd of the flock and I'm dead. It sounds like maybe Ahab believed the prophecy of Micaiah a little more than Jehoshaphat did. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots, that king of Assyria is Benadad, that were with him saying, fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. Go after Ahab, I want Ahab's head. And of course, God's using one of the enemies of his children here to chastise one of them, Ahab. That was God's judgment. Benadad, excuse me, Ahab would die. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots, these are the Assyrians, saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, it is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed or circled about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out and the Lord helped him and God moved them to depart from him. Jehoshaphat probably got his life saved right there for the simple fact that he wanted to inquire of the Lord in the first place about going up to Ramoth Gilead. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. ben said, I want Ahab's head, not the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And a certain man, this would be an Assyrian, drew a bow at a venture. This means in simplicity, he shot the bow, wasn't really trying to hit anything, just fired it up in the air and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness, that being the breastplate. Therefore, he said to his chariot man, turn thine hand for thou mayest carry me out of the host that thou mayest carry me out of the host for I am wounded. 
Lucky shot. You know. God in control. That was his judgment on Ahab. Ahab would die. And, and again, you got to remember, this is not a nice person. Ahab and Jezebel were responsible for killing so many of God's children. These pe they were evil, evil, evil people. I'll just put it that way. And the battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself, or held himself up, in his chariot against the Assyrians until the even. And about the time of the sun going down, he died. There's one thing that you sure don't want to fight against. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. And bear with me. We're going to work our way around a little bit this afternoon. And we're going to be talking to you about the one world political system, the Antichrist, what is, what is our role in fighting that? Should we fight it? So bear with me a minute, though. I want to make a couple of points before we go to that. Acts chapter 5. The church was really growing. Believers were increasing, both men and women, coming to the church. The apostles were healing people, driving out demons. They were teaching people. It was to the point that even people... Uh, were bringing people out in the streets on their couch or beds that were sick, hoping that possibly even the shadow of Peter would cross over them and therefore heal them. Of course, it wasn't Peter's shadow that healed anything. It wasn't the apostles themselves that were healing. It was the Holy Spirit that Christ promised them before he left that he would leave with them. But all this healing, all this teaching, I mean, all these believers leaving what they believe in the church and joining the church of Jesus Christ, would that make the uh, higher-ups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees happy? I kind of doubt it. Let's see. Chapter 5, verse 17, the Acts. Then the high priest rose up and all that were with him. This would be Annas and Caiaphas which is the sect of the Sadducees. Now you must understand the Sadducees, not only after Christ was resurrected, didn't believe in the resurrection, but before Christ paid the price. They did not believe that there was a resurrection of any type of soul or spirit when we passed away. And were filled with indignation. This word in the Greek is zelos. It's the word from which our English word jealous comes, or envy. They were envious of the apostles because the apostles were convincing people through the acts and the power that the Holy Spirit were giving them. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. This, in the, if you take it back to the Greek, means they physically accosted them and threw them in the public prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple of the people all the words of this life. Better translated, all these words of life. What are the words of life? It's the gospel, the good news. The words of how you can obtain eternal life. 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, the Sadducees, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. Uh-oh, we got a little problem here. The boys are done gone. They're in the temple. 22. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, meaning it was locked, and the keepers or guards standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. They were gone. Spiritually, this made me think about Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, where those that have the key of David can open doors that are locked and they can shut doors that no man can open. 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple 
And the chief priest heard these things. They doubted of them whereunto this would grow. This means they, they were perplexed. How could this be? What, what's going to happen next? Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. I wonder what they were teaching the people. Imagine it was what the angel, the messenger of the Lord, told them to teach the words of eternal life. Can you see a type for the elect? What happened to them? They were standing in the temple teaching. Gets better. 26. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. No physically accosting them this time. For they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. No violence this time because they feared the people. The people were being taught. The people were being healed. They were casting out demons from them. The people were believing them. 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. Uh-oh. Boy, that looks like a type for some of us, does it not? And the high priest asked them, listen up for me now, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? What name is he referring to? The name of Jesus Christ. And behold, and, and yes, he did in Acts chapter 4, verse 18, they straightly commanded them, do not teach in the name of this name, this name Jesus Christ. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Whose doctrine? And intend to bring this man's blood upon us where it partially belonged. <clears throat> Talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's how you determine whether you fight or flee. Right there, my friends. We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. He resurrected Jesus, the apostles continue, probably Peter speaking whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. His blood is on your hands, Peter is saying. Him, Christ, hath God exalted with his right hand. He not only exalted him with his right hand, he exalted him to his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. 33. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart. This means they were exasperated and took counsel to slay them. First they took counsel to slay our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now they're going to take counsel to slay his very apostles. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel, as we learn in chapter 22, verse 3, taught Paul in the perfect manner of the law. Paul, who would go on to write most of the New Testament, God writing it but using Paul to do so, was instructed in the law by this one Gamaliel. So he must have been a pretty important man in God's eyes as well. But he was a doctor of the law had in reputation. This means he was honored among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. This means take the apostles out of this court. And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. You better think about what you're about to do to these men. What were they about to do to them? They were about to kill him. That's what they were plotting to do. Gamaliel is about to give him a little history lesson. 36. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain. And all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered, this means utterly dissolved, and brought to naught. Not even one. 
what Gamaliel is going to point out to him is that if something is of man, it always comes to naught. If something is of God, that's how you know that it's really there. And he'll make the point. 37, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew away, or caused to revolt, better translated, much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Well, that wasn't of God. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, or withdraw yourselves from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. If it's of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. I think we will all agree here in this building. That's one thing you don't want to do is fight against God. I want to pose maybe, and a gentleman asked a question last night that was kind of along the subject of what I want to hit on now and bring home to you. And I'll refresh your memory. This question was about, well, what if I, I live in a small town? What if I'm delivered up before the councils in my small town? And his concern, I know, was one that I have had in the past, was Mark 13 tells us, don't premeditate what you're going to say. Christ taught in the New Testament, if you meet them in the way, and they say, isn't Antichrist wonderful? You say, you bet, he's great, have a nice day. <laughs> so the question I'm posing this afternoon is, who do we fight? When do we fight? You know that God uses his own power and gives it to the enemy to chastise his own children from time to time. We sure don't want to fight against God's plan, do we? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 30. Chapter 30 of the book of Ezekiel, we're going to pick it up with verse 1, just a few verses to set what time frame we are prophetically talking about here. The word of the Lord came again to me, as being Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, How ye, woe worth the day, or woe be the day. Verse 3, For the day is near. What day is near? Even the day of the Lord is near. A cloudy day, it shall be the time of the heathen. This time of the heathen is uh, from Luke chapter 21, verse 24, which you know Luke 21 being the counterpart to Matthew 24, Mark 13. So we're talking about the time frame of the day of the Lord, the second advent. Now let's skip to verse 20. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, I want to point out here that historically this occurred exactly four months prior to the fall of Jerusalem. 21. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed to put a roller, this is a bandage, to bind it, to make it strong to hold the sword. In other words, no one will lead, lean on Pharaoh again. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And you can look at Pharaoh, king of Egypt here as a type for all that go against God's plan. What am I talking about here? I'm saying, Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, God wanted him to lean on the Lord. What did he do? He leaned on Pharaoh against God's plan. Pharaoh 
uh, th being a thing of not like we were talking about in Acts, and you'll see it came not. I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong and that which was broken, and I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. Pharaoh, uh, as it's stated in Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 14, God promised that Egypt would always be a base nation, but here he's prophesying, never again will anyone be tempted to lean on Egypt rather than myself, the Lord speaking. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. Just like those that followed Thutis and Judas of Galilee back in Acts chapter 5, they came to Nott and they were dispersed. 24, and I, this is God speaking, this is the Lord speaking, I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, type for Antichrist, and put my sword in his hand. What did the Lord just say? He's going to put his sword in the hand of the king of Babylon. If you back up to Ezekiel 21, which we're not going to do today, but you might make a note of it and might want to hit it a little bit this weekend. But it's talking about this sword in Ezekiel chapter 21. And God says, my sword is furbished, meaning it is sharpened. It glistens and it will be utilized in the hand of the king of Babylon to test both the righteous and the wicked of my children. God will allow it. That is going to happen. But I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. Deadly wounded? What does that bring to mind? Revelation chapter 13, verse 3 possibly. We're not going there, don't turn. When did this happen? This happened four months prior to the fall of Jerusalem. Prophetically, will the deadly wound occur four months before the return of Antichrist? I'm not saying that, but I can see a correlation there. Can you? 25, but I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon. This is God speaking. And the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down, and they shall know that I am the Lord, when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. Applies to everyone that fights God's plan. That sword will be stretched out across the land, it will test both the righteous and the wicked. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. That kind of frightens me a little bit to think about the sword of God being in the hand of the king of Babylon. But it really shouldn't, should it? Jesus Christ gave us power over all of our enemies. That includes, my friends, the king of Babylon. But what about this one world political system that's going to get this deadly wound? You know, I, I hear letters, we get letters, we get tapes from all over the, the country, the world. Join this organization. Let's take up arms and fight the one world system coming into existence. That's what's dangerous, friends, right there. Why? That's God's plan. Do you want to fight against God's plan? Revelation chapter 13, that one world political system will come into power. It will receive a deadly wound. Satan, who has been cast out as the dragon, will revive that one world political system. That's written. That will happen. And if you take it upon yourself to fight against that one world political system, keep it from coming into being, you're fighting against God's plan, friends. That's dangerous. But what's the difference here? I've got a problem with this. I, I, I really want to work out this in my mind. When do I fight? When do I flee? I like to think of it in this respect as far as the political system is concerned. What was the first prophecy in the Bible? 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God said to the serpent, because of what you've done, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And that seed shall bruise thy head, and your seed shall bruise his heel. I like to think of the one world political system as the tail of the dragon. What did God's prophecy say in Genesis 3.15? Bruise his head. Doesn't say anything about bruising his tail. So don't waste your ammunition on the tail of the dragon is what I'm trying to say. But wait a minute though, there's still something else. I, when do I know whether I'm premeditating? What, am I supposed to just let this one world system come into being? Am I supposed to just let Antichrist take over? Absolutely not. It's written in Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 13, that dragon will be given power to make war against the saints. Let me tell you something, saints. We're not waiting around for Satan to think he has power to fight us. He already knows he has that power. We are fighting him right now, okay? But I just still, I don't want to premeditate what I'm going to say. What is my job? What am I supposed to be doing right now? I don't want to fight this one world system. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 33, and it'll tell us what you're supposed to be doing right now. Ezekiel 33, verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, we're still talking about his sword in the hand of the king of Babylon. When I bring it, the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. What does a watchman do? He watches. And he warns the people, somebody's coming. Who is it we're supposed to warn? Three. If when he seeth the sword, we're talking about the sword in the hand of the king of Babylon, come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Those of you that have visited Gravit, when you, first thing you'll notice when you drive up is a 30-foot satellite uplink. That's part of the trumpet. And you have a part in that. Four. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come, this is the king of Babylon, and take him away, or captive, or deceives him, his blood shall be upon his own head. Your responsibility is to blow that trumpet. Your responsibility is to warn the people that that king of Babylon is coming. And if you do that, and he's still deceived, it's not your fault. You've done what you're required. Five, he heard the sound, or he who heard the sound better, of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him or himself, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. If they don't heed the warning and want to go to hell, I say have a good trip. But that's our job, is to warn them. Six, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, don't give a warning, and the people be not warned, if the sword come, this is the king of Babylon, and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity or his sin, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. You know, that's a lot of responsibility. Do you feel up to it? Hope so. Seven. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. What is it that the trumpet actually is then? It says, warn them with my word. Not some quarterly. Not some traditions of men that some yo-yo dreamed up. 
not something of the design of men that's going to come to naught. You hear my word and you warn the people with that. That, my friends, is what that 30-foot trumpet does morning, noon, and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, warns the people that the sword of the Lord in the hand of the king of Babylon is coming. Don't be deceived. Antichrist comes first. Christ comes second. Eight. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not, this thou here is the watchman, dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That's our responsibility is to warn the people. So don't become confused about, well, okay, when Antichrist comes back, I want to be real careful not to premeditate. That's very true. Mark 13 makes that very clear. Well, how do you know if you're premeditating or if you're warning? You see my point? You know, I, I want to get the truth of God's word out to my brothers and sisters and warn them that Antichrist is coming first. But when actually when Antichrist returns, when am I premeditating or when am I supposed to, if you see him in the way, say, isn't the Antichrist great? And you say, yeah, you bet, and keep on going. God will tell you. You'll have the two witnesses here on earth at the time. If you are the elect, one of the elect, God is not going to allow you to do something. You don't want to do something foolish, I mean. How do you know whether it's premeditated or not? Well, I know real easy if I'm premeditated or not. When I start talking like I'm up before the councils, it better be in the tongue, the language of the Pentecost where every man and woman and child on earth can understand what I'm saying. Because if it's not, it's not of the Holy Spirit, it's of myself. That's premeditation. So, where did we get to here? Verse 9, let's cover. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. That's you, the elect. If you did your job and given the warning, you've delivered your own soul in God's eyes. There's a time coming that God's word instructs us to flee. And I want to cover that as we close in Zechariah chapter 14, next to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14, probably more detailed information on what it's going to be like on the Lord's day than anywhere else in the Bible. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah meaning remembered of or by Yah. And there shall be a very great valley. This earthquake is going to create a valley, one you need to know about. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. What this valley is is a safe path for those that he loves so much that have not bowed a knee to Baal. Their names have been written in the book of life of the Lamb since the foundation of the earth. Revelation chapter 13 I'm referring to. The whole world will be deceived except for those written in the book of the Lamb as it's written in Revelation 13. But here we've got Jesus Christ's feet hitting that Mount of Olives from now on, at that point, we're going to have mounts, plural, of olives because there's going to be two of them, one on the north, one on the south. But what's this valley? I mean, what are, what are we going to do? Verse 5, and ye, this is the remnant, shall flee to the valley of the mountains, better translated, my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal only place this word appears in the Bible. What does it mean? It means noble. Do you know God thinks of those that are overcomers as noble? The prime of it is atzal, and it means selected. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake. This is in reference to Amos 1.1. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, 
and the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. You with companion Bibles, that thee is capitalized. What an army. Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, some of our relatives that have already passed on will be in that army, I'll assure you. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall, be, shall not be clear nor dark. Why is that? Because the brightness of our Lord and Savior being with us. Remember, there'll be no sun, there'll be no moon because of his brightness. I can't wait to see it. But it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, and only he knows that day. Not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at the evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem. Ezekiel chapter 47, Revelation chapter 22, same waters that flow from that throne of Jesus Christ and our Father. Half of them, this being the waters, toward the former sea or the eastern or dead sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter shall it be. It shall, won't ever fail, that water, those living waters. Verse 9 to complete. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Well, I look forward to that day. So, Revelation chapter 12 tells us Satan's going to be cast out of heaven. You know, he's going to persecute the seed of the woman, the woman being Israel or Eve, okay? He's going to be given power to make war on us but, and subdue us, it says there in Revelation chapter 13. Why would he be given power to subdue us? That's our job, to be delivered up before the council and to be a witness, just like Peter and the other apostles were a witness for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit when they were talking with those in Jerusalem. So, fight or flight, time for both. And again, when you're fighting Satan, which I know all of you here at this building do on quite regular basis, don't forget where your strength is. And in Psalms, that word strength means fled for refuge. Know where your strength is. That's in your heavenly father. Satan will, you know, we talk about taking names and kicking dragon. If we went on just our own, our little old selves to take names and kick dragon, do you know how far we would get? He would eat our lunch, brothers and sisters. Know where your strength is. Know who to fight, when to fight, what to fight, and definitely know to whom to flee. Let's go to the throne. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your written word, Father. Your written word that tells us step by step how things will be. Prophecies that we know we can count on. We've seen them come to pass. We know the ones that are written that have yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled just as they are written. Father, we thank you for the word telling us all this. Please continue to give us wisdom and understanding of your word, Father, for that is the only true wisdom and knowledge. We'll be careful to always give you the praise in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen.